I actually grew up out in Southern California, <coughs> moved here in 83, and like many young boys growing up in Southern California, my parents signed me up for Little League. And I ended up falling in love with the game of baseball. And my claim to fame is that I played Little League with Lenny Dykstra, <laughs> who uh, played for the, the Mets in the late 80s, Phillies in the, the early 90s, and some other questionable things that we won't talk about. <laughs> Uh, Anaheim Stadium was pretty much in my backyard, and I spent a lot of uh, summer afternoons uh, watching the likes of Frank Robinson, Nolan Ryan, Mickey Rivers, and dreaming that I too would one day be out there on the field in the majors. Well, I never made it that far. Made it to my sophomore year in college, but then injuries took me out of the game. But though I didn't make it to the majors in baseball, I believe that some of the things I learned in baseball have helped me get to the majors in life. For example, when I was standing in the on-deck circle, I would be visualizing what was going to happen, watching the pitcher, studying his moves, but the most important thing that I was doing was thinking about my own thinking. And what my coaches taught me to think was, <clears throat> I'm going to get a hit. I'm going to take this guy deep. I'm taking him to the fence every single time. <clears throat> now, if you know the game of baseball, that's not very realistic, is it? One in three times at best, that would get me in the, into the Hall of Fame. Two out of three times, I'm going to make an out. But yet, I was thinking every single time, I'm getting a hit. What I was not to be thinking was, gee, hope I don't strike out. Or, you know, I got a one in three chance here, let's be realistic. But yet, how many people go through life with a, gee, I hope I don't strike out, or a let's be realistic attitude? Well, that's not visionary thinking. What I learned in baseball, I think, was a fundamental tenet of visionary thinking. Steve Jobs puts it this way, the ones who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world, those are the ones who do. <clears throat> now many people think that folks like Steve Jobs are born that way. It's genetics. I don't believe that. As a therapist, I'm in the, the business of teaching people to think differently. And I think it can be done by anyone at any age. And I got science to back me up on that one. But that wasn't always the case. For about the first hundred years or so of neuroscience research, it was believed that the brain was fully developed around late adolescence, early adulthood, and wasn't going to change too much after that. We now know, through the wonders of uh, modern technology, CAT scans, PET scans, that that isn't the case. Actually, the brain is constantly changing. And the term that we give to this is neuroplasticity, which literally means that our brains are a lot like plastic, in that the circuitry can be molded. And the tool that does the molding is thought itself. And we've got plenty of those. It's estimated that the average adult thinks about 50,000 thoughts a day, each one of those wiring up in excess of 10,000 synapses, those tiniest little units of thought, the space between two neurons. <clears throat> Over the course of a lifetime, with the 30 to 50 billion neurons we have in our brains, that can add up to 500 trillion units of thought. Now that's a lot of cognitive horsepower. But many of us are doing very little to control that, less than 10%. If we're gonna become visionary thinkers, people who change lives, change communities, change the world, we have to gain control of this process. So how do we do that? Advertisers know. Advertisers spent three and a half million for a 30 second spot at the Super Bowl this year. Why? Because there's a big payoff. And what did they buy for their three and a half million? 30 seconds of our thoughts molded exactly to their specifications, right? Now we get that. We get that at the level of advertising, but what about the personal level? What about when it comes to us? Well, let's just suppose that I'm not feeling very confident. How am I gonna get more confident? Well, advertisers know <clears throat> we create that commercial or that sequence of thoughts that leads to confidence and then we load it into the system over and over and over again until we finally believe it. Sounds simple, right? But I hear my clients all the time rejecting that. They'll say things to me like, what good does it do for me to try and think confident thoughts or write down confident thoughts if I'm not feeling confident? I'm just fooling myself, aren't I? Really? If that were true, for the advertising world, then we would have to believe that Budweiser is the king of beers before we saw the commercial, right? It's the other way around. So we have to create that commercial for confidence and then load it into the system. How do we do that? 
Well, first we have to isolate those thoughts. What kind of thoughts are going on in a person with low confidence or no confidence? He's thinking, there's a chance I'm going to fail here, and I'm scared to death of failure. I just can't do it. What about a high confidence thinker? Does he know about failure? <laughs> oh, yeah. How about fear? Do confident people feel fear? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. But they're not thinking that way. They're thinking, I'm doing this. I'm going for it. Nothing's stopping me. I'm hitting this out of the park. And those are the kind of thoughts that we have to capture and write down and load into the system. And the ultimate tool for doing that is writing. Now, why does writing work so well? Because writing engages every lobe of the cerebral cortex. For motor, sen sensory, visual, and language processing, writing gets them all. It's been estimated that a written thought is about 10 times as powerful as a thought alone. So when we're writing, we're exponentially increasing the power of thought. Thus, we have to be very careful about what we write. That hasn't always been the case. Sigmund Freud, father of modern psychology, good guy, got a lot of things right. Catharsis was not one of them. <laughs> Catharsis was the idea that we could get thoughts out of the system by writing them down. Hence, a lot of therapists would, would give their clients the, the task of going out and journaling, right? Write down those negative thoughts, get them out of the system. We were just driving them further in. The key is to only write the preferred thoughts, the thoughts we want to be thinking, the perfect thoughts, if you will. You know, it's been said that practice makes perfect. Not so. Practice makes permanent. Only perfect practice makes perfect. So we have to take those perfect thoughts, and then, well, we have to practice. Malcolm Gladwell, in his book Outlier, states that it takes about 10,000 hours of practice to become an expert. I agree. I took thousands of swings in the batting cages, thousands of grounders at shortstop, thousands of thoughts in the on-deck circle to be decent at baseball. Why would anyone think that we could be good at visionary thinking without lots and lots of practice? Now that may sound daunting, but it's really not. It can be accomplished in about 30 minutes of highly focused writing on a daily basis, writing those preferred thoughts. And the name that we give this is metacognition, which literally means thinking about our thinking. So my contribution this afternoon <clears throat> is to encourage folks to rethink how we think about Fort Wayne. From the rivers to the railroads <clears throat> to the dawning of the automotive age, I see it this way. We're standing in the on-deck circle, awaiting our next at-bat, and what do we want to be thinking? I'm hitting this one out of the park. Thank you. <laughs>